Rudy, you started with CAF, what were you, eight years old, like 20 years ago? It's been uh, about 20 years now, Bob. Yeah, long time. I've been knowing you for way too long. Long oh, time, yes, sir. So when you first got going and you had your legs amputated, age of five, six years old, yes. you're, you were the first double above the amputee who wanted to do something like run. At, at that point in time, other double amputees who you happened to meet, were they involved with sports at all? You know, at the time when I had my legs amputated, it was uh, 1995, 96, and uh, at that time, double amputees were considered, uh, it was very difficult for them to stand up upright without a walker. Uh, it was uh, kind of unheard of for them to run or to do any, any type of sports. So the doctors would, would, would tell me and my parents that, uh, you know, the, the best option would prob- probably be a wheelchair. Right. Uh, you, you might be lucky to walk on a walker, and you'd never run, never ride a bike, never do any sports, you know. The technology at the time was just just wasn't there, but uh, I, I think I think myself and everyone around me we had different plans. So what was fascinating for when we first started CAF, the idea was to give people the equipment they needed to stay in the game of life through sport. Yeah, you went to your first Paralympics when you were 16, yes. right, in Athens in 2004. What was that experience like, and how did that change your life? Yeah, no, I, uh, when I first got involved with CAF, I was uh, eight years old, and I was the first uh, kid that uh, CAF ever worked with. And right. little did we know it would snowball into what we have now. We have, uh, we have the kid, kids' fun run at the Challenge Athlete Race. We have uh, programs for kids, Catch a Rising Star programs. Yeah. And we have a lot of focus on the youth, which is awesome. They, you know, they need a lot of attention. Uh, and now, uh, back when I was younger, I was telling everybody when I was eight that I want to go to the Paralympics in 2000. 2004, uh, and uh, I remember I would I'd train every day. My mom would drop me off at practice at 4:30 before high school, and you know I'd be tired for first period of class. But uh, it was all well worth it when I finally made my uh, first Paralympic team. I was 15 years old, and uh, I was just going to get some experience and, and enjoy enjoy the, this whole whole thing. And I ended up uh, on day one uh, breaking the world record in the prelims, and then coming back for finals and winning the gold medal. And uh, it's just uh, something that I never uh, something that I've always dreamed about. About, but I never ever expected it to, to actually become a reality. And uh, you know, I, looking back now, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, definitely that's the highlight of, of my life was winning my first gold medal. And and knowing that when you set goals in your life, five, ten, fifteen years down the road, and work hard at those goals, you look at those goals every day. You put a picture on the wall of your goal. Yeah. Uh, you, you think about it every day. You know, you you, you can achieve it. You know, and um, and I, you know, I w- wouldn't wouldn't have done it without the you know the help of everyone around me to to. Put Push me. So back in the day when you're thinking about, gosh, I want to get involved with sport, you were really the only challenged athlete that you knew. When you went to your first swim meets and you saw all these legs scattered around, you saw blind athletes, you saw wheelchairs, what were your thoughts? Right. No, no, from, from the start, I, it was never about being a, a professional athlete. It was never about being a Paralympic athlete. It was just about being... Being a young kid, I just wanted to, I just wanted to go out and, and play and have fun and be like my brothers and sisters. I have a brother, two sisters. They're both able body. I just wanted to be like them. I didn't want to have to have my legs be holding me back. Uh, and so I remember uh, I showed up on the pool deck because I wanted to try swimming. My dad suggested swimming, so I remember we were on the pool deck and I was the only kid on the deck with with a, with a challenge with a disability. And everyone they all automatically uh, associated associated me with the name the the no leg boy, the boy with no legs, and. That just, uh, I did not sit right with me. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, no, it, it was not cool with me. And then, uh, uh, not, not the fact that it was just, not the fact that it was no leg boy, but because, you know, they, they kind of, they kind of se- they separated they me. You. Yeah, yeah, they right away said he has no legs. There's no way he's going to be fast as us. Uh, so that's when I set my first goal. I told my mom, I told my dad, and I told my parents, people around me, I said, I want to, I just want to beat a kid with legs. That's all I wanted to do. If I can do that, then we're all going on the right path. And I remember, it took me about six months months to finally uh to finally uh, to do it and uh, I, I remember i was swimming the 50 freestyle yeah. i came into the wall hit the wall and i remember i looked over and i touched the wall before him and i remember he looks at me and then he looks up at his friends and said man the kid with no legs beat me and you know his friends were making fun of him and that's when i knew i was like that's that's it right there and that kid's been in therapy ever he, since <laughs> he's been having problems here and there no. uh, but you've always been the guy to change perceptions right yes, yes. because no double above knee amputee was going to run you were going to be on a walker you're on stilts next thing you know you're running a sub six minute mile right yeah then triathlon right you've done little triathlons when you're a kid but 
all of a sudden one day you said, I want to go do the Ironman. Well, as soon as you, as soon as you get into the triathlon world, I got into it back when I was seven, eight years old. I started doing relays, started doing the swim portions of the relay. Uh, a gentleman named Terry Martin yes. would, was uh, one of my first relay partners, and uh, we ended up doing relays for, for a number of years. And as soon as you get into triathlon, you start educating yourself about the sport, and you know that the prize, the, really the prize of the sport, in my opinion, is, is Ironman. Is getting to the Ironman starting line and then getting to the finish line um, is, is just epic. And as a young kid, I used to watch it on TV. I used to watch Ironman Kona on TV. And, yeah. and, I, and, and I would think to myself, you know, how is it possible these guys can go this far, this long? Uh, and I, in the back of my head, I always knew that that was something that I would try. It was just granted I would try. If these people were crazy, they're out there doing it. It's just a 17, 18-hour race. I want to go do that. I want a piece of that. So uh, I remember I did my first sprint triathlon when I was 10. Uh, I did my first half Ironman in Clearwater, 2007. Yes. Uh, and I thought it was a breeze. It was a breeze. Uh, it, it was yeah. a breeze. Flat course. Yeah, so it was a big deal. It had packs of hundreds going by <laughs> and just catching on the bike, catching a good drift. And then, uh, so with that mentality, I was thinking, you know, Ironman's a... What's a big deal? What's a big deal? What is everyone training so hard for? Uh, my next experience was uh, 2009, Kona. Uh, Kona Ironman. Uh, I went over there and I uh, had a very humbling experience. Yes. Um, I was on the bike for, you know, about nine. Nine, nine and a half hours. And, that, and when you ride, right. you don't have quads or hamstrings. Right, I am so riding. So you are a butt guy. You're I'm basically I'm, glue, all glutes. I'm riding with glutes, upper body. hip flexors. Uh, I'm using a lot of abs. Uh, I don't. I usually don't have aero bars, so I'm right. really uh, more upright. And I use a lot of upper body strength as well. So, uh, you know, a traditional cyclist, they, they say keep your body, upper body, right. you know, don't move it. But I'm, I'm just using everything, trying to get every piece of uh, energy out of my body and out of the bike. And on the hills, I just put it on, on a very low gear and spin it up and you know, the bike is definitely the hardest but um, that's it's, 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 it's an Ironman it's 112 miles no matter what so uh, and Kona I ended up missing the cutoff by just just a little bit and uh, it, it was not one my, not my proudest moment but I learned a lot uh, I learned a lot about myself a lot about my training uh, that's what I got involved with uh, um, coach Muddy Waters uh, we ended up uh, fixing my whole bike taking off the aero bars yes. and we you know we, we put some more thought into the bike and because that was my weakest uh, point out of the three sports and uh, a month later I, I wanted to get my revenge I wanted to uh, I wanted to, to finish an Ironman it was, uh, it was it was it was something that uh, just I always wanted to do and I didn't want to wait a whole another year I didn't well, want to wait also there was a lot of people following and you. I had you I have put a lot, a lot of, of all those other little kids yeah. who were missing legs so or I, chairs I wanted to I wanted to set the example you know if you don't finish an Ironman you know it's not the end of the world you just got to get back on the horse and try it again uh, so a month five five weeks later I found myself in Tempe Arizona and I uh, ended up uh, swimming an hour, which it was a pretty good swim. Really, really cold. Took me 15 minutes to get get warm, and then got on the bike and three loop course. And uh, first loop was awesome. Second loop a little flat, and the third loop uh, it was. Uh, it, I, I was feeling that. Uh, <laughs> I was feeling that third loop. We were, uh, we were worried about you making that yeah, bike cut off. So uh, finally, we, we I got in the transition and made the bike cut off uh, eight and a half hours. So I had about half an hour to spare. Yes. And, um, it was it was a good feeling, but uh, it was kind of a scary feeling because I knew I still had 26 miles. So good I was, news, bad news. Yeah. Good news, I finished a bike. Bad news, yeah. I got to run a so marathon. The, the race was just starting. Crap. Yeah, the race was just starting for me. Uh, first loop again, I felt great. Uh, second loop, uh, uh, I started to really feel the pain. And then the third loop, uh, I definitely hit, hit my wall. Uh, I, and uh, I was able to climb out of it and, and, and push push that last six miles and finish to, to finish a 1606 uh, Ironman. So under 17 hours, I, that's, I was, all that that's all that matters. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, there's still Kona Ironman. I, I got to get back and, and finish that Ironman in good fashion. So, for the kids who are out there, and you've been such, uh, you've been the Pipe Piper for the Cameron and Cody and yeah. and so many of these other little double amputee kids yeah. who had no, and, and someone like a Jake Frank who had no idea what was out there. Right. How important is that to you? You've got, you know, you've got gold medals, you got silver medals right. from the Paralympics. You finished the Ironman, but I know for you, a lot of your favorite moments are when you see when you were at the Paralympics. Olympic trials this year yeah, and yeah. there's uh, David Gelfand yeah. and there's some of the kids who were little guys yep, now they're grown now they're, they're the Paralympics men. right yeah, the Paralympic yeah. trials yeah. How, how important is that stuff for you uh, the mentoring aspect to me that, that's that's most important uh, more more important than winning medals winning breaking records going on trips it's uh, being able to motivate and inspire these young kids to to live a, a live a, a lifestyle a life with that, that they chose that yes. they want to do is, is to me is most important you know when I was when I first started I 
really had I literally literally had no one to look to look at to example to mimic and say well he has no legs and that's how he takes his legs off to jump in the pool to ride his skateboard I had no one so for me I had to figure everything out by myself yes. I had to figure out how to ride a skateboard how to run how to ride a bike uh, everything and and uh, you know it, it wasn't easy I wouldn't have done it without the people around me helping me but I find that most important to to be the example to show these other kids that you know having no legs having one leg you know having no arms no legs being blind whatever the challenge may be is is, is really just a challenge and you're gonna have to wake up in the morning the next day and put your legs and put your shoes on and 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 continue on so uh, it's it's uh it's it's just amazing being able to be to be that that the guy to to motivate and, and inspire are these these kids because they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be breaking my records uh they're gonna ones they're the ones that are gonna be showing the world here very soon that um you know we're we're a movement and we are here to stay and we're uh we're, we're, we're here to inspire the world love it rudy garcia tolson has been our guest again you can donate at donatecaf.com 